Today on Inspired Money. You know, like when you walk into a house and somebody says, you can afford this, dude. This house, this big, with that view, I can put furniture in here and live here? Really? Yeah, you don't have to drive that crappy car anymore. Go buy yourself a really nice car. I what? I can't? <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, and then the bummer is sustaining it. Because how many people do we know that have the highest highs and they end up going, you know, they think that wave's going to ride forever and that wave goes away. All the waves go away. Nobody hands it to you. You have to continue to grow. You have to continue to expand. You have to continue to learn. You have to continue to transform. You have to stop doing things that worked really well for you before that aren't working for you now. And you have to recognize that and jump into a new situation. This is episode 57 with personal trainer, author, speaker, and creator of P90X, Tony Horton. Welcome to Inspired Money. My name is Andy Wong, a managing partner at Runnymede Capital Management. Each week, we bring you an interesting person to help you get inspired, shift your perspectives on money, and achieve incredible things. From making it to giving it away, Inspired money means making a difference, creating something bigger than oneself, and maybe, just maybe, making the world a better place. Thank you for joining me. Hey, Inspired Money Maker, welcome back. There's a lot of buzz right now with people getting back to work or school since summer is over. What are you busy working on right now? I'm heading down to Orlando to attend and speak at FinCon, where money nerds unite. If you're in Orlando, drop me a line because I'll be there September 26th through the 29th. And on Tuesday night, the 25th, I'm part of the live Stacking Benjamins show at the Improv Comedy Theater. It'd be great to see you there. If it's your first time listening, welcome to Inspired Money. This show is different from other personal finance podcasts because we don't want to just learn how to live with money. We want to put money and inspiration together to prove that money is not the root of all evil. And let's get inspired to live richer lives, make a greater impact, and together, make the world a better place. Thank you for joining me on this mission. So we've got a great show today. Let's kick it off with this clip. Um, I was on tour. When I'm on tour, I'm in really good shape. When I come home, I cook, I eat, I get fat and happy. Mm-hmm. Um, but aren't you doing like the, what is it, the P90X? P90X? What is that? I was that? doing that. It's crazy. He was into the P90X workout thing. What is that? No, it's like this video this guy Tony Horton does where he's just like, you bring it. It's about bringing it. Oh, it's just about bringing it. <laughs> right? Had that Stiller, Stiller's in like crazy good shape. Right, he's like right. really in good shape. And he does this thing called P90X. Do you know what this is? P90, it's a kind of workout It's thing. like a workout DVD yeah. and he, he convinced me to get one. Yeah. And right. so Ben got me into it, and now I go online and I look at the videos of people's transformations. I, like, start weeping and crying. It's, uh, <laughs> it's very emotional, this P90X. I'm super excited because we're talking to Tony Horton. Odds are that you've probably worked out with him because he's the creator of the number one home fitness program of all time. P90X has sold a combined total of more than 7 million copies. In the intro clip, you heard Oprah, Pink, Ben Stiller, and Jonah Hill praising the program. Congressman and House Speaker Paul Ryan is also a fan. From military bases to my basement, Tony is dedicated to getting people into peak physical shape. In addition to being an elite trainer, he's an author and motivational speaker. In this episode, you'll learn how Tony Horton's love for acting, exercise, personal development, and a little bit of luck led to P90X, techniques for setting personal goals and making them happen. Tony's a great example of how embracing a growth mindset can lead to success, to consistently feed your desire for learning, exploring, or being curious. Now let's get inspired with Tony Horton. Tony Horton, welcome to Inspired Money. It's so great to have you on the show. Andrew, my pleasure, my brother. Let's jump right in. What's your earliest childhood memory of money? <laughs> well, you know, I, have, I would have to say I have two. One where, where, where my father and parents were doing pretty well, 
And then uh, things shifted a little bit, like it has in so many families across this country over time. But early on, you know, my dad did pretty well, so we got everything we wanted on Christmas morning. You know, you got the bike, the train set, you were taken care of, you got your sweaters and your socks and your underwear and everything else. Um, so it was just, uh, I remember being taken care of. You know, my parents had enough money to give me my own room and uh, feed me and clothe me, and I thought that was perfectly normal. But then my father lost his job, and we had money problems, which created a lot of stress in our family. I think with anybody that, you know, when you're doing pretty well and then you're not, uh, that, that up and down flow of cash can create real, real drama in the household. And so I think my father was between jobs for about nine months. And so we, you know, we had to cut corners a little bit. And it was a lot of things that we were, we were used to getting, but could not have as a result of, of the situation. So that was probably, you know, from as young as three to about 12. And that happened more than once. Those are real world life lessons as a pretty young kid. Yeah, absolutely. So Tony, today, I think everybody knows you from P90X training videos that you created and the infomercials that has put your face around the world. You've come a really long way from the kid growing up in Trumbull, Connecticut. What was your childhood like? It was a mixed bag, I, actually. You know, I mean, I was an Army brat initially, so we moved about six times before I ended up in Trumbull, Connecticut in fifth grade. Um, and then my father changed jobs, like I said earlier on. And so when you get a new job, you got to go to a new town. And um, I was a small kid. I was not a great student, partly because you know, when you're moving that much as a kid, you want, there's, no, there's nothing stable in your life. So you're in a new neighborhood, There's, you know, you're in a new school. I mean, I had to reinvent the wheel over and over and over again. And I had a speech impediment called cluttering. Uh, and that made it more difficult because you became a target. What is cluttering? Cluttering is, um, the best way I could describe it is you're, you're, you're talking so fast, based mostly on just being insecure, that the words start to pile up <laughs> on top of each other. And... Then there's some stammering that goes with it as well. Um, it wasn't like um, like a normal speech impediment where you, 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 I didn't have that so much. But I did a little bit. You know, I would talk really fast like this, and I would think because I was really insecure, I was afraid to, anyway. Is that something that you grow out of? Uh, that's something that I trained myself to grow out of. I didn't have any actual formal mm, schooling for it. It, it, it came from wanting to be a performer. So initially I was a pantomime. You know, I was sort of a silly kid and I, I, I had a pretty good sense of humor even, even as a kid. But the stammering thing made it difficult. So I would learn jokes uh, that would help me slow down because I would know the sequence of things within the joke, the formulation of the joke, and that allowed me to, to slow things down. I think a lot like singers there are a lot of singers out there, performers that have speech issues, but when they sing, it goes away. It was kind of like that. And, you know, I, I just worked really hard. I mean, I was a communications major and a theater major in college, I think partly because I wanted so badly to eliminate that. And I worked pretty hard on my vocabulary. I'm, I'm probably more of a malaprop than I've ever been, but I, but I worked pretty hard at being able to find enough words and phrases and language to be able to get through a sentence without stammering. I think when I'm fatigued, sometimes it happens a little bit, or when I'm dealing with a certain amount of stress when it comes to work or life, it'll slip in here and there. But I, I'm not as hung up about it as I used to be. I used to petrify me, it used to just just paralyze me. But now I don't care. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so when you take the pressure off, it doesn't matter as much, you know. And I think partly because my life has been fairly, I'm fairly successful at this stage, um, it doesn't happen as often, or really, it's very rare. You say that you weren't a very good student grade-wise, but I get the sense that you have this really strong desire to learn and ability to teach yourself things. Yes. Um, I'm very interested in things that I'm interested in. I'm not as interested in things that I'm not interested in. I mean, it's, it's, I think what, what a lot of, uh, the reason why a lot of kids are being homeschooled now is there's more emphasis on, on, on areas where these, where these kids flourish. You know, you're going to get your reading, writing, and arithmetic, right? But then there's also emphasis on the things that you really love and enjoy so that you become a productive adult pursuing your passion as opposed to, you know, going through the rigors of regular schooling 
and then you come out, whatever, whether it's high school or college, not knowing what the hell you're supposed to do or ending up in some job that you despise purely to make money so you can pay your bills and mortgage and stuff. So, so you know, when I, when I moved from New England to California in 1980 with no money in my pocket, I mean, I was wide-eyed and bushy-tailed. I was just fired up to be in California and discover what this place was about. And I fell into a very athletic group of people early on. Um, and they were different than, say, a lot of the coaches and teachers that I had on the East Coast where it was super competitive team sports. You know, you go to a track, you're just running around the track for conditioning and, you know, maybe you care about your times or not. Or if you're in aerobics class, for me, it was just about meeting women. You know what I mean? Like, oh, wow, this is fun. There's only, only women in here. When I would go to the gym, um, people were really accommodating and really open to showing you, you know, how to get fit and get strong and, and build your muscles a certain way. Um, and so I did, there was no pressure to try to compete or win. You know what I mean? There weren't winners and losers when I found the kind of people that I found. And maybe it was just serendipity. I don't know. But it was, I'm glad the way it worked out. And if you look at whether it's Power 90, P90, X, X2, X3, 22-minute hardcore, whatever program I've created, there's a lot of that in there. You know, there's a lot of modifications in there. There's a lot of variety in there. There's, a, there's humor in there because exercise is hard enough. And when you take it really seriously all the time, you know, when it becomes this drill sergeant type mentality or, you know, this desire to, you know, uh, appease your ego... Uh, then it's just, it sucks, you know, it's just not, it's not the way I want to do it. I want it to be fun, I want it to be creative, I want it to be, I want us to think on our feet, you know, and and that way you avoid the boredom and injuries and plateaus that come with, you know, traditional types of repetitive fitness routines. You think that supportive athletic group that you found, was that a little bit of the difference between a West Coast culture versus East Coast, or was it just by chance? A combination, a combination. I, I think where I grew up, I mean, it was football, basketball, uh, baseball, hockey, you know, and tennis and golf, right? But it was all about scoring and winning and beating your opponent. And that, there was no skateboarding or surfing or rock climbing or mountain biking. It just those things didn't exist in 19, between 1976 and 1980, you know, or, or should I say 19, early 1970s to the mid 1980s. On the East Coast, it just it was different. But you know, I came out here, and it was just a you know, unlike now with social media, you know, everybody's up to snuff on the latest, the greatest, the newest, the best, right? So uh, it, it's kind of worldwide. It's it's but you know, I might as well have been on the North Pole and at the equator. Uh, you know, when it came to a lot of things, when it, when it came to sports and training and mentality and and uh, personal development and those types of things, it was day and night. East to West, but it's changed since mm-hmm. then. Well, the world is definitely smaller. Like, it wasn't a straight line for you, right, from moving out uh, to the West Coast and creating videos. You did a lot of odd jobs, and I'm curious, how clear was your goal when you arrived out in California? Not clear at all. No goal. Survival was my goal. My goal was to come out here for the, for the summer June, July, August, and go back and get my degree at the University of Rhode Island, and then stay there and find a wife and get married and become a salesman, you know, or whatever. I don't know. I mean, I came out here just to have fun, and I thought I would dabble in acting and modeling and whatnot, and and I did a little bit, like tiny pieces, um, but I so I so fell in love with the culture, I fell in love with the weather, you know, I fell in love with the beaches and the, the, a lot of the people. It was a blast meeting new people. It was, it was, I mean, I had great friends back on the East Coast, and some of them came with me. Um, but I just didn't see any future there for me after August was up. So I called my parents, and I said, I think I'm staying for another six months, and they freaked out. And then I stayed for six more months, then I stayed for 37 years, <laughs> you know. So, uh, but I had no goal, goal at all early on. I didn't know what I was going to do. You know, I thought, oh, I'll come out here, and I'll be a combination of Brad Pitt and Jim Carrey. I'll be, you know, I'll be a leading man and a leading comedian, and they'll just hire me because I'm so fabulous. And, you know, this town is brutal when it comes to that industry. And I dabbled, and I did my commercials and small parts in movies. But at the same time, I was a, I was a painter, and I was a carpenter, and I was a handyman, and I was a pantomime at the pier, and I was a frozen statue at Oscar parties, and I was a go-go dancer at Chippendales. I, know, I mean, and, you know, 
whatever whatever odd weird job I could do to feed myself and pay my rent, I did it. But you know, fortunately for me, because I got into the fitness stuff pretty pretty quickly, um, I started training my boss. I was a runner at 20th Century Fox, a production assistant at Fox Fox Lot, and my my boss guy by the name of Harlan Goodman noticed that I was changing. You know, I had an agent at that point. After about a year and a half, I had my first agent, you know, and I, I'm in Hollywood and I have an agent. You know, I felt like I'm going to be on the Johnny Carson show before you know it because of that little did I know. But he noticed my changes, so I started training him in a buddy's garage three days a week, and then he got in great shape. And then he was walking down the hallway of a music uh, production company, and Tom Petty was walking the other way, and Tom noticed Harlan's results. Tom Petty called me up the next day. My roommate picked up the phone and hung up on him because he thought, why is Tom Petty calling our house, our apartment? So Tom Petty called back. Hey, I think you hung up on me. My name is Tom Petty. <laughs> so I went to Tom's house the next day. I got him ready for a tour. I had about four months with him, and he went from, you know, zero to a hero in four months, and he went off. He was wearing tank tops and doing these incredible sets and just had tons of stamina and energy. And then... Then Billy Idol called, then Stevie Nicks called, then Sean Connery called, and Shirley MacLaine and Stephen Stills and Bruce Springsteen, and, and, you know, then all of a sudden I became a celebrity trainer, getting up every day, you know, training rock and roll stars from the 60s and 70s. Did that blow your mind? And then, you know, it was just one of these weird things. It was all serendipity, man. You know, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just, you know, I was training everybody the way I, you know, because I was going to yoga, and I was going to Pilates, and I was going to... Gold's Gym and World Gym, and I was, you know, doing bodybuilding, and I was doing the track work, and I was taking martial arts classes. You know, I'm a pretty good mimic, you know, so I would, I, I when I'm really into something, like I, like I said earlier in our conversation, I pick things up pretty well. I didn't have a degree or a certificate of anything. I got that later because I realized that was probably important to have, you know, in case somebody calls me on it. But, um, but I was just really good at, I, I was different than my coaches. I didn't like, and these guys had all these degrees and and training and physical fitness and exercise science, and they were they were terrible. You know, you felt humiliated. You felt you were embarrassed. You were you were berated. You know, and I wasn't going to do that with these people. They're you know these are big time celebrities, and I just I made it fun. I had my you know I we didn't talk about exercise the whole damn time. We talked about life. You know, and and they all got in pretty good shape. And at the same time, I'm doing the stuff that I, I you know I was going on auditions and doing stand up comedy poorly. And I was part of an improv group, so I was pretty good on my feet when it came to that kind of thing. And uh, my first job was with Nordic Track. Um, I went on an audition for them, and they liked it. I could walk and chew gum at the same time, so I said, that's rare. You know, the guy can read a teleprompter, and he also looks pretty fit and knows what he's talking about. So that was my really first introduction. Then I met the CEO of Beachbody, and we did Power 90 and P90X, and voila! You mentioned personal development being one of your interests and something that's important to you. The phrase, do something nice to someone that you don't like, I understand, led to a pivotal moment in your life. Yeah, you know, I mean, there was no such thing as personal development back on the East Coast. In the summer before I came out here, I picked up a personal development book called Looking Out for Number One by uh, uh, Wayne Dyer. And a pretty thick book, you know, I never read a personal development book. Everything was just schooling, right? So it, it, it just completely changed the way I was doing things, you know what I mean? I was, I was uh, you know, looking out for number one wasn't about being selfish. It was really actually more about being selfless and how if, if you start, you know, in so many words, you got to get your act together in these various categories of your life. And when you get your act together in these categories, then you can begin to sort of expand and learn and grow and transform as a human being. Wow. What is that about? That's crazy talk, you know, but I ate it up. And so when I came out to California, I kept reading these books, people like, uh, you know, Eckhart Tolle and, uh, and M. Scott Peck and Gary Zukoff and folks like that, Powell, all these different, different personal development books. And then, of course, a lot of them would have seminars, so I'd go to their seminars, always at the airport, always down at LAX, you know, like a little weekend thing. And you'd meet them and you'd, you know, go through these really pretty interesting exercises. And a lot of it was silly. I didn't find any value in some of it, but I found a lot of value in, in a lot of it. And so... I pieced it all together to kind of help reform my outlook in life. And in one of the personal development books I read, you know, there was a lesson at the end of every chapter, and the lesson was go out of your way and do something really nice or even extraordinary for somebody that you're in conflict with. And I thought to myself, geez, I don't even do that for people I like, so this is going to be weird. So there was a group of guys I used to play basketball with, and 
they were attorneys and they were pretty intense guys. And one, one, one of them in particular, and I didn't really get along very well. At least that's what I thought. And he was complaining about his weight. At this point, you know, I was training Billy Idol, Tom Petty, Springsteen, folks like this. And I didn't even know if he knew my name, to be honest with you. And he was complaining between games, complaining about his weight. And I said, I think I can help you. And he said, yeah, don't you train a bunch of rockers? And I thought, geez, you even know that? And, and uh, the following Monday I saw him. And a, and a year later, he introduced me to Carl Deichler, the, the, the creator of, uh, of a company called Beachbody, which didn't exist at that time. You know, this guy, Carl Deichler, was just an employee of this, this gentleman. And, and Carl and I got we hit it off, man. It was just fun, you know. We had we had the same sense of humor. We had the same level of creativity. Uh, Carl wanted to start really changing the the way uh, direct direct response infomercials were, you know, because they were you know silly little pieces of equipment that didn't really do anything, and they used you know models and stuff, and it wasn't real. So he said, "Hey, you, what you do is real. It works. You're, you know, it's it's been proven with all the celebrities. I got I got Carl in the best shape of his life." So. Can you figure out a way to do this for people in front of their television? I said, that's not a problem, you know. And, and I did. And, um, you know, I was in the same apartment for 21 and a half years with a view of the convalescent home, thinking that's where I was going to end up after so many years. Just walk down the stairs, cross the alley, and there I'll be. Did you have a lot of debt in those days? Yeah, I had about 60 grand in debt, which, wow. you know, doesn't seem like much now, but when you can barely make your rent every month, 60 grand was a lot. I probably had, oh my God, eight or nine credit cards that I would pay off one to buy another and, it would be, you know, interest rates for free for three months and it went up to 23%. It was crazy. You know, I was just buying stuff I couldn't afford. You know, I just didn't have any kind of financial knowledge at that time. Uh, and then, you know, literally I went from a crappy little apartment to a really nice five-bedroom home, which was a, kind of a massive upgrade in a short period of time. Um, you know, getting royalty checks with amounts of money that I didn't even know were possible. Um, so it was a wild, it was a wild ride, and here it is, twenty years later, and um, apparently, you know, people still do my stuff and still enjoy what I have to say. And it's, I just turned sixty, and yeah, 60 happy and birthday! It was nice to know that I'm still relevant in a a world filled with uh, millennials that are trying to compete with me. Yeah, it's really amazing how you helped the one guy. Uh, that, that you were playing basketball with, and then how that led to the introduction to Carl at Beachbody. And it's like, by helping one guy, it it just, you had this opportunity to, like, magnify the thing, um, because now you've helped millions. Well, you know, it, it's, I think anybody that's had anything, any kind of success whatsoever, you know, from something as amazing is that as to just meeting your wife or something, you know, there had to have, there had to be, you had to take some kind of risk. You had to pick up a phone or write an email or go to a club or join a gym or get a new job or move from your town. I mean, it required some kind of effort, you know? And so the only reason I'm where I am is because I continue to do that on some level almost every week. I mean, I worked out with, with, with three new people this week. I got, you know, I do this plyometric thing on Mondays. And, you know, sometimes there's many 20 people here and people will say, hey, can I bring so-and-so? And I think, sure, if we've got enough room, we'll make room, you know. So the, the, I guess the, if there's a lesson here, make room for new people because one of them could change your life forever. <laughs> That's a great lesson. And I think that part of that is saying yes rather than saying no, because oftentimes it's so much easier to say no. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yes, it's harder than no. Well, what do you get when you say no? You, you get nothing. First two letters of nothing are no. <laughs> so you want to try to avoid that as much as possible. And, you know, you're not going to say yes to everything. You're going to end up being overwhelmed or, or having experiences that you don't want to have. Hey, let's go skydiving naked. No. I'm going to go no on that one. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? Let's, let's, let's jump out of this airplane in a squirrel suit. Never done it before? Say yes. What's the worst thing that can happen? You know what I mean? So you have to be practical and you got to prioritize. And, and, you know, you want to be able to check as many boxes as possible because life's too short not to be able to have some pretty amazing experiences. But, you know, you also just, like I said, you want to make sure that you don't go overboard with the yeses. But if there are, you know, like I'm doing a seminar coming up at the Omega Institute in Rhinebeck, New York uh, oh, cool. in August. And one of them is called These 20 Things. And one of the 20 things is check that box. So, you know, I'll, I'll come out to everybody and I'll say, so 
how many boxes have you checked where you felt like you really took a risk or you did something maybe outside of your outside of your comfort zone? You know, what I mean, write those down. I mean, no, you know, give yourself a little pat on the back. Um, and uh, how many haven't you yet? Because none of us are getting younger. And and you know, whatever it is, like maybe it's skydiving, or maybe it's taking a piano lesson, or maybe it's learning how to sing, or or you know, maybe it's who knows, any number of things. You know, so write down the five that you think are the top five that you've really kick butt on and like you go yeah i did those five things or maybe you don't have maybe you got one or two or none i mean that's something to really look at and then write down five more you've been talking about for the last five or ten years and haven't done it write down why you haven't done it and then write down when you're going to do it i'll give you a whole year you know what i mean i mean it's like when it's written in your handwriting on a piece of paper and it's staring back at you and you say to yourself over and over again that you're going to do it and you haven't well, maybe you will now that you've written it down. And I do that all the time, you know. That's how I ended up jumping out of a Chinook at 15,000 feet over the big island of Hawaii. That's how I got in an F-15C and threw up seven times um, um, at Kadena Air Force Base in Japan. That's how I had the courage to, you know, keep taking one step after another to end up marrying my wife because I was single for the first 58 years of my life, you know. So... Write it down and then go get it because then you're just going to be dead and people are going to go, oh, here lies somebody who really didn't do much. <laughs> you know I mean? Don't be that person. Good God. Tony, I think you were 46 when you created P90X. You got married at 58. Do you consider yourself a late bloomer? Oh, my God, yeah. Oh, my gosh, yeah. And most people don't want to st- they want to stop learning after high school or college. They kind of fall into their little pattern and their little pattern turns into a little rut. And then they end up with early onset curmudgeon disorder, and then they end up with terminal curmudgeon disorder, and then they just fade away after their 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. That ain't me, man. I mean, you know, I shot P90X when I was 46. I was probably developing it. I had a whole year to develop it, but in my late, in, uh, from 40, 44 and 45, I was in the early stages of it. Yeah, but I think on camera, I actually say, I'm 46, and I'm doing some silly thing. But, but yeah, and then getting married later in life, and... Uh, and I'm in transition now at 60. I'm, I can feel there's a major, major, major shift coming. There's things that I've been doing a certain way that have been working up to this point that feel like they're not working anymore. Hmm. So tell me, what does that shift look like? I wish I could tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you after I put my name at the bottom of a piece of paper. But in the meantime, I can't tell you. Um, I hate to be so so mysterious and cryptic about it. But... but uh, yeah, there's just some, you know, I feel like um, I feel like things are a bit stagnant for me right now. I feel like uh, um, there needs to be big changes that I have to take some serious risks. And I can tell you that it definitely keeps me up at night. But I go for my runs and I do my meditation and I do my yoga and I ask all the right questions of all the right people and I keep gathering information. And when that transition comes... Uh, it won't be that I, I just winged it, you know what I mean? It'll be that I really did the research and time and effort to figure it out. Yeah, I totally agree with your embracing getting out of your comfort zone and being willing to take measured risks. When you look back, I see just many, many instances of transformation in your life. And some of them were serendipitous and some of them like the stars aligned because you were into fitness, and yet at the same time, you were into improv and acting. And those created opportunities for you that it, it differentiated you. It made you unique. When an opportunity to do an infomercial came up, it's like, Tony Horton's the guy. Is there a specific moment that you can think back to where you know, taking the leap, getting out of your comfort zone really made a difference in the path that you took? I don't know if there was any any single, you know, what the Japanese say, satori, you know, a sudden moment of enlightenment where you go, oh, yeah, this is all adding up now, and now I know what I'm supposed to be doing and where I'm supposed to be going. You know, or, or I think it's uh, um, uh, Gladwell, who's, uh, he wrote uh, The Tipping Point, you know. There usually has to be a lot of a thing, a lot of things that occur before that happens. It's not like... You know, it's not like you go into the 7-Eleven and you buy a lottery ticket and all of a sudden somebody calls you up and say, hey, yeah, you, you just won $140 million. That's, that's, that, that kind of a thing. Like when something is handed to you without all the work prior, yeah. you're probably going to screw it up unless you got the right people around you. 
for me, it was a series of things that happened over the course of time. There were, there were a lot of doors that had to be open, a lot of falling down that had to happen, a lot of so-called failure that needed to take place. Um, but for me, it, was, it were things like sign, going, signing up for an acting class. You know, just, you know, you, you hear that this act, acting coach is pretty good. He's an hour and a half away in both directions, but I'm going to go and I'm going to study and I'm learn from this guy and I'm going to be terrible at first. And then you keep going because you think there's some kind of light at the end of that window and you do that for a couple of years. And then you, a buddy calls you up and says, hey, I want to start doing comedy. We both think we're pretty funny. What does that look like? We open mic nights, you know what I mean? Setting up cabarets and, you know, putting flyers everywhere to get people to show up to your, you know what I mean? And you get up there and you're kind of funny, but not that good. And so you decide to do it again because <laughs> you think, well, I can improve at this, you know. And then you join an improv group. I mean, every time I did any of those things, it was self-motivation. Like people, all, I, I do interviews like this. They go, who was your mentor? I didn't have one. I didn't have one. My father was on the road Monday through Friday. Um, he was sort of a, not, he wasn't an absentee dad. He just wanted to leave me on my own because he didn't like his experience where his father was in his face all the time. So he decided, he thought that the opposite of that was the best way to go. I would have preferred something in between. I just didn't get it. So I had, you know, I was like Robin Williams. I was, you know, in my, in my room cultivating these characters and doing my own thing and playing with soldiers by myself. Not that I didn't have friends. I mean, I had a handful of friends, but it was that. It was like, you know, the first time I got on, on stage doing stand-up and I killed. I went, wow, I'm, I can get up. I mean, I, and you think to yourself, I had a speech impediment where I couldn't even talk to my own friends without feeling embarrassed. And now I'm on stage in front of 100 people and they're laughing so hard I have to wait for them to finish laughing. That kind of a moment. Or that when you're at Nordic Track and, you know, you're not perfect right out of the box, but, but after some good direction and a couple of takes, you nail it. Like, wow, okay, this is something I can do. Or you go to a gym and you can, and all of, you know, in, in the 10th month, 12th month, 14th month, you can, you're tracking, like I had a little notebook and I tracked every curl, every squat, every bench press, every rep I tracked it. I mean, this book was in pencil week after week, month after month. And you look back when I bought the notebook and it was, oh my God, I'm twice as strong. So all these experiences are happening at the same time. Physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially, but there's growth. You know, like when you walk into a house and somebody says, you can afford this, dude. This house, this big, with that view, I can put furniture in here and live here? Really? <laughs> yeah, you don't have to drive that crappy car anymore. Go buy yourself a really nice car. I what? I can? <laughs> you, know what I mean? you know, and then the bummer is sustaining it. Because how many people do we know that have the highest highs and they end up going, you know, they think that wave's going to ride forever and that wave goes away. All the waves go away. Nobody hands it to you. You have to continue to grow. You have to continue to expand. You have to continue to learn. You have to continue to transform. You have to stop doing things that worked really well for you before that aren't working for you now. And you have to recognize that and jump into a new situation. That's right. I, I don't remember who said it, but the phrase, what got you here won't get you there. Yeah, right. Exactly right. Yeah, so I don't hear the Satori. There wasn't one magical moment, but it sounds like you're writing down the small goals down on paper and just working towards that. Eventually, it adds up to much bigger things. Exactly right. And figuring out the formula and following the formula, methods, techniques, whatever you want to call them, that where you see progress, I think what happens to so many people is that they will, they'll work their asses off doing stuff that doesn't move, push them forward. You know, they have very realistic goals, but their techniques suck. You know what I mean? But I'm working hard. Yeah, it's, but, you're, but you, you know, you're on a treadmill. You're in the gerbil wheel. It's nothing's happening. Go do something else. Oh, that's scary. Coming up. Tony talks about taking control of the things that you can control, why P90X took off like a rocket, and how exercise can help you if you're struggling right now. But first, a tip from Tony if you think you're doing the work but are not seeing the results that you want. I got a buddy of mine. He wants a six-pack. I really want a six-pack. And he's training 
right? He's working, he's training his ass off. And I go, why, don't you th- why do you suppose you don't have a six pack a year in? I don't know, I don't know, it's genetics. I go, dude, if you track every single meal, every, every morsel that goes into your mouth, well, you know, I eat pretty well, and I watch him eat. He doesn't eat very well. He doesn't eat as well as you. I said, here, here's what you're going to do. Take a picture of yourself every day. Every day with your shirt off for six months. And then, you know, notice that there's a six-pack that starts to emerge. If you have visual evidence of your body, the way you want it to look in front of your face seven days a week, 30 days a month for six months, trust me, that simple act alone is enough that you'll begin to make some real changes when it comes to what you're putting in your mouth. Otherwise, it's just, it's just talk, you know. The show notes for this episode can be found at inspiredmoney.fm forward slash 057. You'll find links to our guest, things mentioned in the episode, and we're adding transcripts, so check the website for details. It's time for the Runnymede Money Tip of the Week. I subscribe to the idea that there are different pillars of health physical health, mental health, spiritual health, and financial health. You need to have a balance of all four of these things to truly be healthy. I love that this week we've got Tony, who will hopefully motivate me and you to get off of our butts and work out. I found an article at time.com written by Penelope Wong, no relation to me, entitled, Why Healthier Means Wealthier. In it, she writes about, when it comes to retirement, Is good health a double-edged sword? Punch numbers into any financial calculator, and it's clear that living longer means that you'll need a bigger nest egg. Here's some good news. According to a National Bureau of Economic Research study, people who were among the healthiest 20% in their 50s retired with three times the assets of the least healthy. This means that living an active, healthy lifestyle correlates with an ability to make and save more and for longer. You see, the data says that a large number of Americans retire not because they elect to, but because poor health forces them to do so. One another reason to follow a good diet and exercise, the healthy also spend down their wealth more slowly. The main factor here is that those in good health are able to delay or avoid expensive healthcare costs that can drain your resources. Let's look at quality of life. Take three parts of the world where people have a greater chance of living to 100, Sardinia, Okinawa, and Costa Rica. In each of these areas, people have found ways to cope with stress. These communities have strong traditions of walking, building family strength, playing with kids, and being active. I hope that you get inspired by today's show to go take a walk, and if you're not already doing it, make time to add exercise to your weekly routine. Let's do this together so we can save more, live better, and longer. That's the Runnymede Money Tip of the Week. Inspired Money is brought to you by Runnymede Capital Management. We help you to plan, invest, and worry less. So what's your biggest financial challenge right now? Do you need a financial plan that includes calculating your numbers for your working years or planning for retirement? Email me at awang at runnymede.com. That's R-U-N-N-Y-M-E-D-E dot com. Or go to inspiredmoney.fm forward slash Andy, A-N-D-Y. I'd love to hear from you. And we can even do a short call since sometimes it's just easier to talk money. You're listening to Inspired Money. I'm Andy Wong. I'm impressed by your willingness to embrace like you're willing to stink at the beginning when you're trying something new. I think that that so often scares people away from getting outside of their comfort zone. But that's why you incorporated yoga and all kinds of different things into P90X, right? Because you're willing to try new things. Well, you know, I don't care who you are. Everybody's got weaknesses and strengths, right? I mean, you're a big bodybuilder. You know, there's different body types. When you understand there's ectomorphs, mesomorphs, and endomorphs, you know, we're, we're some combination. Some people are just pure one of those three. Others are combinations of one of those three because, you know, one per parent was a Samoan and the other one was a Kenyan track athlete, right? So <laughs> you just get what you get. That's your genetics. And so what are you going to do with them? And you have to accept reality. I mean, reality is just something that a lot of people are sort of lately, you know, are trying to avoid because it's too painful to look at, to understand, to, to, 
to wrap your arms around. But reality dictates that you are what you are, and so now you have to deal with with the consequences of that because we're affected by genetics, environment, and behavior. You control two of them. So that's pretty, those are pretty good odds. I can control my environment. I can control my behavior. So I can end up with a pretty good result even if I have a certain kind of genetics. We can all be strong. We can all be healthy. We can all be fit. We can all be flexible. You know, we can to a certain extent. I mean, some people are naturally more one of those things than other people are. But you can have some element of all of them if you're willing to put in the time, the work, the effort. Fall down a bunch of, a bunch of times. Not judge it. Be in the moment. And then just keep pushing forward. Showing up. If you show up, even if you stink it up, something you're, going to, you're still going to be moving forward. There's no such thing as a is a life chart that goes straight up like a rocket. It always goes up and down, up and down. But if there's consistency and purpose and accountability, then the uh, direction will be upward. You know, and if you stop comparing yourself to others or your expectations of the future or how you used to be in the past, I mean, there's so many things that we do that just get in our way. Then you know you're gonna you're gonna see it and you're gonna feel it and you're gonna experience it and it's gonna be awesome. But some people have to work harder than others. That's just that's just the life. You know, I'm a slow learner, period. That I know. You know, I can climb any rope. I can go up any pegboard. I can, um, you know, go around a ninja course like I'm on the moon. Uh, but don't ask me to run a half, half marathon. Holy smokes. Mile 10, my hips are going to explode. And you're going to find my rotting carcass on the ground. I just, not my thing, you know. <laughs> so... But I still run. I ran yesterday. I hated it. I ran six miles. I wanted to run three, but I ran six. I forced myself to do it because it was the right thing to do. Um, you know, so that's why P90X was successful for so many people because if there's 12 different workouts and four of them you were good at and the rest you weren't and vice versa, then there's a certain amount of exercises where you're going to be working on your weaknesses, where you're going to feel embarrassed, where you're going to feel like, holy cow, how come I can do that one so well and this one so poorly? Because that's how it's supposed to go. It's like, it's like who the hell predicts what's going to happen day after day after day? I mean, you, you can schedule the hell out of a day, but the weather, the traffic, your kids, your boss, they're going to alter your day, man. And that's life. Life is a 24-hour, 365 learning experience. And you either, either go with the flow or you, you run into the wall, and there's different tactics and techniques that help you row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, merrily, merrily. What will life be but a dream? But a lot of people want to swim up stream. And I don't know why they do it, but they do. And running into that wall is also part of the process, too, because you learn a lot figuring out how to pick yourself up again. True. Yeah, I mean, walls are going to happen, but you're probably better if you, if you try to figure out how to negotiate around them <laughs> instead of running into them all the time. You know, I mean, you, you know, you, you can't predict the future, but you can certainly plan for it. And so sometimes that'll allow you to get around the wall before you smack it. You know, how many walls do you want to smack before you just go, I give up? Well, Tony, what I love about P90X is that it's not a magic bullet. It's not an infomercial that says that I can eat and drink whatever I want and I'm going to end up super fit. My wife bought me the P90X videos for my 40th birthday and she was under the under she thought she gave it to me and she thought that it was she says I got this for you because it's 30 minute workouts every day. And I popped in that first DVD and I said this is not a 30 minute workout and <laughs> it's like 5 to 6 days a week this is going to actually work. Uh well thank you man it's funny you know I was talking to the um uh head of health and wellness at uh, Bank of America a week ago, talking about a, a, an event that I'll be doing next year and maybe having some of his top corporate folks uh, come to the event. And, um, you know, a very formal conversation. You know, he's basically created this wellness program for 250,000 employees from around the world. And, uh, you know, I introduce myself, not assuming that people know who I am or what I do, you know. So I say, hey, my name is Tony Horton. You know, I'm pretty well known for from some people about P90X. And then, of course, he goes, he says, dude, I know. And right, like when a guy says dude after, you know, a really important conversation, you know that he's been impacted by P90X as well. So, Yeah, how does that uh, feel? Because your videos, your workout, I think you have converts not only in Hollywood, but in Washington, D.C. You have singers, you have sportscasters, you have professional athletes. I mean, it's really amazing. It's worldwide. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how many total. Uh, I think six or seven million, and then about four million were pirated. <laughs> and a lot of those people don't even know they bought a pirated copies. But who cares? They were affected positively as well. 
Um, you know, I like to think of myself as a C minus celebrity in that respect. Uh, there's a lot of folks that are more well known than I am. But, um, you know, the chief of protocol for the United States of America was doing P90X. Uh, you know, the former president and first lady were doing P90X. So, uh, you know, generals at the Pentagon were doing P90X. Military, I've been at 59 military bases around the world. And the reason why I keep getting invited to these bases is because, you know, P90X was the kind of program that allowed our men and women in, our, our, in the armed forces to be better equipped uh, at doing what they do and, and making it easier for them to pass their PT tests. Because if you're in the military, you know, once or twice a year, depending on your on uh, on which branch you're in, you have to take those PT tests. And you know, if you're sitting behind a desk, that's not easy sometimes. And so it's just a it's a privilege and an honor to be able to have helped so many people, people I never have met. I met a gal at one of Beachbody's events, our annual summit in Indianapolis, and. Uh, you know, I show up to a, you know, I'm only obligated to be there for an hour, but I got there at eight and I left at midnight. You know, when there's people lined up, you can't say hello to the people at the beginning of the line and then ignore people at the end of the line. That just doesn't seem very fair. So it was 11, it was 1145. I had to get up at four o'clock in the morning to do a super workout with 15,000 people. But, but I met this woman who had lost 120 pounds. She had tears in her eyes. She was there with her six friends uh, who would have never, they would have never met. These were all women that met through uh, Beachbody's coaching opportunity and they were all super fit. It was like talking to a bunch of, you know, professional volleyball players, the way they all looked. And, you know, it was just an, ama- just, just an amazing thing to hear that she had been overweight her entire life, tried everything, and did P90X of all things, which is not really for people who are overweight. But I created it and designed it in such a way that it, it allowed you to keep wanting to come back. And when you're getting injured and you're plateauing and you're getting bored with something else, then you're not going to come back to that. So I try, I understand that that those three things, which are, you know, stifle so many people, I try to create it in such a way so that, that people would want to come back, even though they couldn't do the push-ups or couldn't do the pull-ups or couldn't do the jump knee tucks or abraporex was impossible. But I wanted to give them those modifications and I wanted to make it fun and I wanted to give them the kind of faith that was required to do that thing for 90 days. And when I met her, I mean, there's so many stories like it, you know, much like yours, much like people around the world. And it just keeps you going. It just makes you feel like, God, am I the luckiest guy in the world? What a, what a, how, how much fun is that? And, and, and you discover not only do they lose the weight, and, but they have more confidence. And they have more energy and they're better parents and they're better employees and they're less of a burden on the, on the health care system. And, and they're making better food choices for themselves and their family. And they're an influence on, you know, second cousins and People at work, it's, it's, uh, it's, I don't know, man. I, I just pinch myself sometimes. When you were in the studio recording P90X, could you have even imagined the impact that you've had? No, not at that point. I mean, we had done something called Power 90. You know, Power 90 was a, 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 a beginner's version of P90X. The studio wasn't as nice. Uh, I, my personality hadn't fully been formed on camera yet. Um, uh, cause I didn't, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't sure that I could be so silly and be so relaxed, you know, cause there was so much more, so much at stake. It was really the first project that I had ever done with the company, you know, so I didn't want to, I didn't want to overdo things, but it still, it still did, did really well. We sold like 4 million copies. So it changed my lifestyle. Um, but when we got to P90X, I was just, I was in the right mental state. I was at the peak of my confidence. I was at the peak of my physical fitness. We had rehearsed the living hell out of it. You know what I mean? The cast members, a lot of them came from the original test group. So I had established these relationships with these folks for more than 90 days. We went to about 120 days, you know, because there was a lot of time between the end of the test group and shoot day. We didn't want these folks to get out of shape. So we just kind of kept going, kept bonding. And when it came out, you know, I remember talking to Carl, our CEO, who, who was there directing it at that time early on. And he just said, hey, man, go be you. Don't, you don't have to stifle any of it. I, you know, if you get too goofy or silly or crazy, then we'll, we'll tell you. And I did. <laughs> and they told me. <laughs> and we had, to, you know, we had to shoot some stuff over because I got a little bit too weird, you know, too silly. But, you know, it, just, it, it was one of those really crazy, magical moments. Uh, and we shot, that, we shot all those. We shot two and sometimes three a day in a week. And it's the most fun I ever had on, on stage at that point, the most fun I ever had on a job. It didn't feel like work. It just felt like we were having a blast, you know. I love that. I just, it's my, it's my you know, talking in front of live audiences, getting up and, and doing that with folks is, is a blast. 
as you know, that you're having that direct contact. But being on stage and just getting up there uh, and doing your thing on a set is such a blast, man. Tony, how long did it take for P90X to really take off? Because it took a little bit of time, right? Uh, the first year, it didn't do very well at all, because uh, this is sort of at the early stages of the internet, of the interwebs. And, um, uh, you know, uh, direct, direct uh, response television was, you know, at its, in its heyday at that point. So everybody was getting their information via the TV, not so much via their computer or laptop or, or phones. And um, so, uh, yeah, it went out in the world, and it wasn't a cheap product, and it looked hard as hell. Um, and so for that reason, a lot of people said no. But there was a very strong, finite group of people who said, yeah, man, I've never seen anything like this before. i got to check this out because this looks serious. And so those people, a handful of people, maybe a, you know, a few thousand, started submitting their before and after pictures and video. They were so, so thrilled with their results. Right? So they had to see it, get through 90 days plus, gather up their, their footage and their pictures and send it to us. And we, we kept getting this amazing home video footage that was a thousand times better than the stuff that we had shot, you know, with our test group or with, you know, people who, had, who we knew that were doing it. And so we just pulled out the footage from the original test group, which was great. It was all real. I mean, these are real people working hard. But I was, you know, they saw that I was me in the studio with them. Um, but when you saw this, you know, kind of bad lighting with, that was blurry. I mean, you could tell, man. The average person at home said, "Hey, man, that's 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 the real deal." And so it went. It literally fell off the table, and then it exploded like a rocket ship. I would say uh, in month ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, something like that. And uh, yeah, that was that was it. Real people doing the real thing, and we put that in the sh- in the show. We call it the show, the infomercial, and kaboom. And the rest is history. Congrats on that. Indeed. Am I correct to assume that you believe that physical fitness is sort of the gateway to getting your mind in the right place, your emotions in the right place, so that you can make big things happen? For a lot of people. For most people, for some people, I don't know, I I, I wouldn't really... I just know that if you're struggling right now in various aspects of your life, then fitness will help solve it for you. And that's only because of... It's chemical. Purely, it's brain science. When you exercise, you breathe heavy, uh, you're sweating, all those types of things, you know, you're exerting yourself, uh, especially, you know, with cardiovascular exercise, you know, and plyo's cardio ask, and even yoga provides a certain amount of heart-lung leg um, synergy. Um, you release norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, brain-derived neurotropic factor, the hippocampus, the temporal lobe, the dentate gyrus, right? So there's the temporal lobe, the hippocampus inside the temporal lobe, and the dentate gyrus, which sits inside, this little tiny string inside of your head. It affects everything about how you look at the world. It affects your memory and your cognition and your sleep and your sex drive and your productivity and whether you see the glass half full or not. It's everything. It's the reason why people take drugs and the reason why they drink alcohol and the reason why they smoke and the reason why they have make bad choices, <laughs> right? Because it feels good. You're, you're flooding the brain with that and dopamine. You're flooding the brain with these things. But, you know, short-term pleasure usually leads to long-term problematic situations. But short-term discomfort, hard work, discipline, accountability, purpose – leads to a lifetime of joy, happiness, laughter, productivity, purpose, you know, all the things that you want. And so you have to decide whether you're, you want to work for it or cheat trying to get there. But, I mean, look, you drink, you know, when you're drinking a lot and you're having a lot of fun and you're partying with your friends, it's really great, and then the next day you feel like crap and can't do anything. Same thing with cigarettes. Oh, okay, I'm going to smoke because it satisfies my pleasure now. But, oh, well, lung cancer, you know what I mean? Like, it's like people can't predict the future by now, you know? I mean, it's nuts. So... John Rady's book, Spark. You want to read a book about how, to, how exercise affects the quality of your brain function and your life and how you see your life and whether you can go out and kick butt or not, then John Rady's book, Spark. I mean, he's, a, he's, a, he's a, over there at Harvard, and then he kind of knows what he's doing, and he's, he's a lecturer and a pretty smart guy. He works with a lot of kids that have uh, learning disabilities, and he's got them all eating vegetables and exercising five times a day. And these kids are doing things that no one ever expected them to do, purely based on physical uh, exercise and, and healthy food. Who would have thunk? Sounds like a great book. I'll, I'll include that in the show notes for 
our listener. John Rady Spark. Yep. And Tony, what you're doing, it goes beyond just fitness. I mean, I know that you have P90X, there's P90X2, P90X3. You've got lots of videos. You've built multiple streams of income, it looks like, because you have events. You've authored books, which also include fitness. But your most recent book, The Big Picture, 11 Laws That Will Change Your Life, um, that seems to have a broader focus. You could call it a personal development book. It's it's also autobiographical to a certain extent. I tell a lot of stories about my journey so people can understand that I just didn't end up this way. You know, I wasn't, didn't come out, you know, Johnny Fitness, uh, Mr. Football Hero. None of those things happened for me. So, and I wanted to write the book is because personal development is how I started. If it wasn't for all the personal development work that I did, and a lot of people say self-help, but I guess the new term is personal development. Without it, I wouldn't have had the perspective to be able to begin to understand the importance of regular exercise. And for me, early on, I was exercising for what I would consider now all the wrong reasons. But at that age, in my 20s and early 30s, I was doing it for reasons based on, on ego. You know, I wanted to look a certain way. It was all about the before and after pictures. I, I, my goal was to try to, you know, meet women and assume that they wanted to date me because I had big pecs and strong arms, when in reality, oh, you need to have some income and a personality, too. Oh, okay. So that came with a lot of the personal development and, and, and finally growing up, you know, and not being such a, a wise guy bonehead, which is what I used to be. So, but the one thing I that was happening to me without realizing it was as a result of exercising regularly, I was waking up earlier. I was more responsible. I was more productive. I said yes more than I said no all of a sudden. And I just thought it was because I didn't know why, honestly. But, you know, if I had John Rady's book back then, I would have been able to understand why all of a sudden I was just more optimistic and more productive and happier and and, and showing up to things. I mean, I would have never signed up for the improv group or the done stand-up comedy or gone to these acting classes if I hadn't been exercising. I don't think I would have had the, the energy or enthusiasm to do those things. But it was because of exercise that I that I had this journey, you know. So, you know, anybody who is struggling, who is, you know, having a tough time, I mean, you know, it's nice to look in the mirror and see a body that you'd like to see. That's that's number one. I mean, that's that'll give you confidence above and beyond, you know, looking in the mirror and going, oh, geez, look at me. I'm not happy with this at all. And so, but exercise is as much or more so a mental and emotional thing as it is a physical thing. I mean, you know, one thing about exercise is you can do more. You can climb up those stairs with two heavy suitcases to the airport when the escalator goes down. You can show up to a, to a, you know, a rock climbing gym and, and, and perform when you didn't even know you could do that. Or you could, you could, your world expands. I can, I can, oh, I want a mountain mountain bike now, or I want to join a ray, I want to do a 5K, or I want to go climb those stairs, you know, uh, at the beach, whatever it is. There's all these things that you can physically do. And then at the same time, there's also uh, great benefits with how you think because of the you know release of these chemicals and dopamine and whatnot. And your mind and your emotional state are, are one. They're connected. I mean, all three are really physical too. But when you're treating yourself poorly, when there's no physical fitness and you're eating garbage, then your mental and emotional state are going to obviously be negatively affected. And people go, well, maybe it's just bad luck. No. You're 35, 40, 50, 100 pounds overweight. You eat like crap. You're drinking too much. You're, you're dehydrated and you're malnourished. What a shock that you don't have the life that you have. <laughs> I mean, and here's the awesome thing. What are the only two things that you ultimately control? What you put in your mouth and whether you decide to move or not today. Let's see, can you control your kids? You'd like to think so. Can you control your spouse 100%? No. Can you control your boss? No. Can you control the traffic? No. Weather? No. The future? No. But you can decide what time to get up, what you're going to do, and what you're going to have for breakfast and lunch and dinner and in between. Those things you control. And oh, by the way, is it really, really hard for the first 30, 40, 50 days to go from nothing to something different? Of course it is. But you got from first grade to second to third to fourth to ninth to twelfth, and some of you went to college. You know, you didn't, you know, you kind of had to do that one through twelve. A lot of people dropped out sooner, but, you know what I mean? You managed to do that. Why? Because you wanted to learn. You wanted to grow. You wanted to transform. You wanted to be a productive human being. And if for whatever reason, most of us, high school, college, grad school, were done, 
and we can't figure out why it starts to go downhill after that. It's because you stopped learning. You stopped exploring. You stopped being curious. You said, started saying no a hell of a lot more than you used to say yes. So just do what you did in first grade, and second grade, and third grade, and fourth grade. Just keep going. Twelfth grade, thirteenth grade, fourteenth grade, twentieth grade. You know what I mean? I'm in like in sixty seventh grade. <laughs> You're right living now. proof, Tony. You're living proof. Well, I mean, either that or be miserable. I don't want to have early onset curmudgeon disorder, which turns into chronic curmudgeon disorder, which becomes terminal. Curmudgeon disorder, which means you're a goner. You're just a cranky old finger pointing, churlish old man or woman. Not me, baby. I'm gonna hop, skip, and jump my way into my grave. That's my goal. <laughs> I like to ask all of our guests, how do you define success? Joy, happiness, and laughter, often, regardless of how much money you got in the bank, or how many fancy friends you have, or how much stuff you own. Joy, happiness, and laughter, baby. Three simple things. Yippee-i-yay. I mean, you know, look, I've trained a lot of really successful, wealthy people. Some of them were happy. A lot of them were stressed out, holding on to all their stuff and their prestige and their stature in life. You know? It's, uh, it's too much work. You can do both. Ewan McGregor. He's become a friend of mine. He's done P90X a couple times. You know, here's a guy that's, he goes from movie to movie to TV show to movie. I mean, he's, he's prolific. I mean, you go watch Moulin Rouge and try not to go, how the hell did they do that? It's just amazing. He's an, am I was telling my friend Scott Pfeiffer, who's a, uh, has a nonprofit called Go Campaign. He saved about 135,000 orphans from around the world. He and wow. you and her pals as well. And we were just saying today, I mean, what a prolific human being Ewan McGregor is. He's just kind and funny and smart and talented and and altruistic and, you know, not to say that every one of his days is perfect. That's not. I mean, he's like any other human being. But, man, does he have the, the time and energy to be awesome, you know? Uh, and I know other people like that who are at that level and pull it off. But, man, a lot of people just, you know, they work so so hard to get all this, all they have all this power, money, and success, and they're miserable. No, thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you, Tony. Thank you for sharing your amazing story and how you've helped millions of people better their health, their lives, and how you've made a bigger impact. Can you tell the Inspired Money listener how they can follow you and uh, get more information about your products and learn more? Ah, the plug at the end. I love this part. Um, you can go to TonyHortonLife.com, TonyHortonLife.com. I got t-shirts and baseball caps and TH Care, it's called TH Apparel, and TH Care is uh, hair and body lotion and, and good stuff, um, formulated, Prop 65 compliant, Whole Foods compliant, not tested on animals, custom made for me, a guy with dry straw hair and crackly skin that spent too much time in the sun in the 70s and 80s. So yeah, I mean, it's really, really good stuff. It's unisex, it smells just so clean and fresh, it's good stuff. So, uh, and I'm doing a lot of events, I'll be doing, I'm doing the Paragon Experience the Omega Institute in just a couple of weeks. So, I mean, I don't know how soon this goes out, but um, that's a fun event. It's really intimate. It's, it's only 100 people. We hang out for about two days, two full days. And uh, all of it, all the personal development, obstacle courses, yoga, meditation, and lots of reindeer games and laughter and fun and joy. Sounds incredible. Love you, Tony. Thanks. Andy, or should I say Andrew, thank you, brother. So what was your favorite Inspired Money moment? I have to admit it, my mind is a little blown having this opportunity to chat with Tony Horton. After spending all those early mornings doing P90X workouts in my basement, when you talk to the TV, the DVDs don't talk back, so I'm just not used to this. Besides setting goals, eating right, and moving your body, my big takeaway was this. Make room for new people. One of them could change your life forever. In adulthood, we get very busy with family and work. Tony's reminder to focus on people and building community, it can unlock opportunities beyond comprehension. Look at Tony. There are over 10 million P90X videos out there in the world. It's just mind-blowing. 
If you had a different favorite Inspired Money moment and takeaway, let me know by going to inspiredmoney.fm forward slash Facebook. I'd love to see you there. All of the music on today's show is by Jim Kimo West. Aloha, Kimo. If you enjoy this show, please tell a friend. It helps more people to find Inspired Money and help grow our community. Together, let's make the world a better place. Thank you for tuning in. Have an inspired week and do something that scares you.